optics of buoying up the fictive valuation of your company rest entirely on the assumption that players can earn then that's a bit of a different incentive set, isn't it? More people play Axie Infinity to try and make money than play it because it's a game they enjoy. This is a fundamental flaw in the model. If you pitch your game based on earning potential, you are going to attract people seeking to industrialize your platform faster and in greater numbers than would otherwise play. This is exactly the parasitic situation that games for decades now have been actively minimizing because it creates vicious negative externalities. If players can sell their in-game stuff, then it changes the way that they play the game. It changes the way that they optimize their playtime. Since the vast majority of games are openly a non-investment, a straight exchange of money for entertainment, also known as a purchase, players tend to optimize their playtime for intangible returns like fun, distraction, socialization, relaxation, challenge, achievement, and narrative fulfillment, with absolutely no expectation that the money and time they put in should return anything other than those things. The key shift here, and the meaningless buzz phrase that you'll encounter online, is the proposition that the results of playing a game should retain value, which is code for having a potentially speculative price. In order to try and keep the grift mill running for another few months, Sky Maven have tweaked the economy to reduce the amount of SLP players can earn per hour. It's a nightmarishly thin edge to be walking on, and the main thing it has managed to accomplish is enabling an entire strata of pit bosses running teams of players grinding out smooth love potions. And, like all bosses, they have not taken the downturn in stride and have instead started cracking the whip. We do not accept mediocre gaming anymore. Need at least 120 to 150 SLP a day, and those who yield more will be rewarded with additional percentage. I prioritize those who have gaming experience. We have a separate program for the future. Evangelists like to point to this as though it's inspiring. People in economically disempowered countries able to make a meager living by simply playing a video game. I reject that framing. It's horrifying. Our global system is so fundamentally unjust that people are patting themselves on the back for generating a whole new kind of online uwu pit boss who tells you to grind harder or you're fired, but caps it off with a blushy emoji. Oopsie, looks like someone didn't meet their quota. This sucks. I think the thing that normies don't get about NFT bros is their dedication, the staggering volume of capital they already control, and how deeply rooted they are in the culture of the people who operate the platforms we all use every day. And that alone is a good reason for people to pay attention. They have a lot of money and a lot of clout that they can use to try and make fetch happen. This is something of a splitting point. Basically, the future shakes out in one of two broad ways. One is that some new technological buzzword comes along and blockchain and Web3 lose their sway over investors, the stream of new buyers dries up, and the early investors cash out as best they can, popping the whole bubble. The other is that they're successful, and cryptocurrency is able to crowbar its way into enough corners of our lives that it becomes unavoidable. We're all forced in some way to maintain a crypto wallet, to manage whatever coins and tokens become necessary for participation in society, providing early investors with a captive audience and steady flow of capital. To quote German sociotechnologist Jürgen Guter, better known by his online alias Tante, there are parts of your digital life that currently you can't really sell, but that's what they want to change. Everything needs to be bought and sold. Everything is just a vehicle for more speculation. The reason they want you to be able to resell your access token to some service instead of buying or renting it like today is to create even more markets for speculation and the smart contracts can be set up in a way that at every corner they profit. The claims that this technology facilitates an immutable ledger of ownership is itself largely hollow posturing even from within the ecosystem. Remember that most of the actual things being referenced are not contained within the chains themselves because the chains are too slow, restrictive, and bad at their job to actually store media, and because many of the things being sold are purely ephemeral. The IPFS address for any given media token can be effortlessly minted onto another competing chain, or even the same chain. That's not even right-click saving, that's referencing the exact same media. Why is the token on Ethereum more authoritative than the token on Tezos, or Cardano, or Solana, or Ergo, or Celo, or Binance, or Algorand, or Polkadot, or EOS, or Tron, or VeChain, or Ethereum 
classic or phantom or stellar or stax or neo or waves or hollow or link or radix or harmony or oasis or icon or secret or iota or crown or terra or omni or enigma or elastos or edgeware or vitam or fuse or gather if a chain hard forks which version of your stuff is the real one bitcoin is itself mired in a turf war between bitcoin bitcoin cash and bitcoin sd the myth of immutable ownership governed by these systems is predicated on a monolithic victor. In reality, your NFTs within the Ethereum ecosystem are ultimately just as trapped, sandboxed, and meaningless as your Steam trading cards. You'll hear about protocols like Polygon that aim to let you move stuff from chain to chain, but that's sleight of hand. You can't remove something from a chain, so all they really do is create a new token at the destination and add a note to the bottom of the original token that says, I'm currently somewhere else, please don't move or sell me. It's an ask that's governed by smart contracts so vulnerable to bad coding. In video game terms, they would be immediately hammered looking for item duplication glitches, a vulnerability that's basically inevitable in a mass adoption scenario. It's a system that is at once impenetrable and brittle, and that arrangement disproportionately empowers the dishonest. One of the complications is that it's basically impossible to extricate the digital scarcity concepts of NFTs from cryptocurrency and the core philosophies that cryptocurrency was built from. One rose out of the other, and they are basically forever entwined. One of the ironies of all this is that any legitimate artistic or anti-capitalist uses of the underlying technology are contingent on the tech remaining niche. On a very basic level, the systems just suck, being slow, difficult to use, and generally open. For the most part, to the degree that they're usable at all, it is largely at the mercy of only having a few users. There are blockchains that are reasonably responsive and reasonably cheap because they're not popular. Hick Ednunz is a well-regarded art market on the Tezos blockchain. Transaction fees and deflation are, at the moment, relatively minimal, and thus a lot of the transactions are able to operate in the range of $5 to $20. But that state exists by the grace of being 45th in popularity, just high enough to actually have users, but not high enough to have attracted too many bots. If Tezos goes, as they say, to the moon, then that all changes. Users adopt the platform disproportionate to the scale of validators, the value of Tez skyrockets, and the actual marketplace of people using Hick Ednunz experience hyperdeflation, where hoarders are rewarded handsomely and buyers are punished. Okay, we need to pause here for a moment because this is actually really important, but absurdly complex, like textbook length subject matter. So here's the short version. Deflation is counterintuitive because the line is going up, which makes it look like a good thing, but it's only good if you already have the currency in hand. As the purchasing power of a currency increases, typically because cash gets more scarce, the cost of goods and labor goes down. A deflationary economy punishes buying things, as anything that you buy today will inevitably be cheaper to buy in the future. If you need to buy things that aren't financial assets, things that don't appreciate in value, like food, clothing, rent, vehicles, transit fare, you screw yourself over. This is hyperdeflation, and it's not only designed into cryptocurrencies with their hard cap on total coin supply, but consider desirable by their creators and evangelists. This is what going to the moon means. Now let's talk about unions. Using tokens to verify union membership and participate in union activities relies on the tech being oblique enough that union busters and their clients don't see it as a meaningful arena to monitor. Also, that ship has already sailed. Union busters and gig economy evangelists love crypto. They love DeFi and they love smart contracts and they love NFTs. And why wouldn't they? It's an environment that demolishes consumer protections and transfers tremendous amounts of explicit power to the wealthy. In a lot of ways, this is all just a system for deferring trust onto machines and pretending that there aren't humans on the other end. And if there's one thing that union busters love, it's the prospect of an unbreakable individual contract whose inequities can all be blamed on a machine. The current state of the web, concentrated in a few mega platforms, is the result of compounding complexity. We used to have a web where anyone could learn to write a web page in HTML in an afternoon. It's just writing text and then using tags to format the text. But over time, people, understandably, wanted the web to do more, to look better. And so the things that were possible expanded via scripting languages that allowed for dynamic, interactive content. Soon, the definition of what a website was and looked like sailed out of reach of casual users and eventually even out of reach of all but the most dedicated hobbyists. It became the domain of specialists. 
so casual users excluded by complexity moved to templates, services, and platforms. This process gradually concentrated a critical mass of users into a handful of social media platforms. Already, even within the space, new hegemons are forming. Tremendous amounts of capital and power are concentrating in corporations like Consensus, who own MetaMask, and Animoca Brands, who have wide and deep investments in crypto gaming. OpenSea, the at-present dominant marketplace for tokens on a couple different chains, is filling the power roles users need. While the chain itself is in theory the arbiter of truth, nothing prevents people from filling the chain with lies, and so arises a demand for not merely a chain parser, a service that enables users to interact with the chain, but an interpreter of the chain. Motivational speaker and DC Mark Calvin Becerra claimed to have lost three Ford Ape Yacht Club tokens to a social engineering scam. In reaction to this, he took to Twitter to whip up a mob that could pressure OpenSea and two other marketplaces into flagging the tokens as stolen and blocking them from being sold. Calvin was eventually able to resecure his tokens by paying a ransom because that's really all you can do, and he doesn't seem to consider that from the perspective of the thieves, that's an entirely desirable outcome. They won. Their plan worked. This happens all the time. Board Ape members are particularly susceptible targets of fraud owing to their specific combination of greed and low social literacy. Looking to avoid paying platform fees and royalties, many of them moved off OpenSea to doing transactions on a shady little platform called NFT Trader, which allowed scammers to run a very simple link swap scam and steal at least a dozen different ape tokens in the span of a couple days. The meat of Calvin's incident is the way in which the platforms that interact with the chain are being deputized by users to be the de facto authority not on what the chain says but what the chain means it is just a recreation of existing power structures within the new environment Now this is where evangelists insist that the answer lies in DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, a revolutionary new way to organize people that will allow for the decentralized governance of these systems. So that's the claim, but what is it exactly once you strip off the paint? A DAO is an organization whose membership, roles, and privileges are governed by possession of relevant tokens on a given blockchain. And it's also the underlying software that executes relevant operations. That's kind of really about it. So just to be very clear here, a conceptual DAO consists of three things. People, a digital machine built of smart contracts, and a token that allows the people to interact with the machine. In practice, most things that call themselves DAOs don't have the machine at all, and a substantial number either don't have the token or only have the token. The upside of a DAO is that it makes it easy-ish to create a formal organization at theoretically any scale, from only a couple people to a massive pool of stakeholders, and the program layer makes it possible to automate certain activities and the results. If the organization votes via the DAO interface, the results of that vote are automatically recorded and potentially executed. Though that framing is misleading. As with tokens themselves, there's no inherent functionality in a DAO. It's just a box that code goes into. I might as well be referring to all the things you could do with a web page. As already mentioned, many organizations presenting themselves as a DAO have no machine functionality at all. It's pretty standard to find a DAO that has issued a governance token, the script that's used for voting, with the systems to actually use that token being placed somewhere in the nebulous future of the roadmap. That open-endedness is actually important because while the claim is that these machines will further democratize the internet, the technical complexity that they add, the new specialized programming expertise that they require, concentrates a lot of power in the hands of people who can build the templates that in turn enable non-programmers to actually use it. It's just laying the seeds for the future recreation of the status quo. The Facebook, Google, Amazon dominated internet arose because the technical cost of building a modern website rose far beyond what the vast majority of amateurs could manage. So everyone moved to templates and then to services and finally to platforms. This doesn't even reset the clock on that. The technical cost of creating a DAO is already far beyond any casual amateur, in part because all of this is being built by programmers and in part because of the stakes. 
the only thing this stuff is truly good for is managing on-chain assets. a dao program can see the state of the chain and interact with it so the dao humans can vote on what should happen to those assets and then the dao program can automatically act on the results. but that raises the stakes. because a dao can see and interact directly with on-chain assets, there's the risk that via bad programming or unforeseen exploits a malicious actor can use a dao to access all kinds of stuff. the risk is directly proportional to the value of the assets kept on chain and remember again that evangelists want to put everything on chain. the hilarious thing is that this has already played out once before. in fact it played out with the first dao ever built called the dao. this whole story unfolds over the course of three months in 2016 from april to june. the dao was an ethereum based venture capital fund that aimed to use code to create an investment firm without a conventional management structure or board of directors. a scheme that's positioned as lightweight and reducing bureaucratic overhead but really it just translated to an attempt at minimizing human liability for the actions and behaviors of the fund. this unparalleled expression of greed made the major speculative players in ethereum so horny that during the april and may presale they funneled 14 percent of the entire volume of ether into the dao's central wallet. Now, because the DAO's underlying code was open source, experts and malicious actors alike were able to pour over it for vulnerabilities and, indeed, vulnerabilities were found. however, because at the end of the day, fleshy humans are the ones actually pushing buttons and making decisions, the actual leadership of the nominally leaderless DAO, horny for money and prestige, decided to launch in late May anyway. three weeks later, the DAO's programming was exploited and the attacker was able to transfer one third of the DAO's funds into a holding wallet about 5% of the entire ethereum economy valued at the time around 16 to 17 million dollars. now, because this threatened the bottom line of capital holders, the ethereum project as a whole, the entire thing, was almost immediately forked in order to undo the hack and protect the interests of the wealthy. ethereum classic, the arm of the fork that didn't undo the attack, persists to this day, though it's notably less popular despite being demonstrably more principled. because all the talk about decentralization is a myth, it's just words. At the end of the day, the guys in charge, the guys who built the system to serve their interests, are still in charge and keep a kill switch in their back pocket. Crypto is barely a decade old, and organizations deemed too big to fail already exist. The whole fiasco laid out the truth from the word go. Calling a DAO a revolutionary structure is smoke and mirrors. It's just voting shares. You might as well call Apple a bold experiment in democracy because a baker's dozen and individuals make the decisions instead of just one. Regardless of the future pitfalls, DAOs are also extremely limited. They are, again, just code. While evangelists promise that they can reinvent the social organization, mentally consider all the problems, conflicts, and decision making that social organizations deal with and ask how many of those even can be solved by code. Some of them can easily be turned into computer programs, automated bookkeeping, payouts, collections, data tracking. Sure, that's all stuff organizations conceptually can make use of. But how do you code for the fact that red just really doesn't get along with blue? The pitch promises organizations bound by unbreakable rules, but how many organizations actually benefit from that level of rigidity? in particular, what happens when the version of the rules enforced by code run up against a complication that the coders didn't consider? what happens if someone with legitimate stake in the DAO starts spamming the organization's internal systems with bad requests? what if not enough people participate in voting? what if the system locks itself up? what if the rules are rigged? what if the system commits a crime? If this technology did see mass adoption, a future time bomb already exists in the fact that very, very few of these systems have factored mortality into the considerations of their structure. Because what if someone with an important token dies is a really easy thing to overlook when you're kind of insulated tech bro who reinvents vending machines and calls them bodega boxes. Now, all of these hypotheticals are technically addressable. You can build contingency systems that can account for them. But then you need to consider contingencies for those contingencies. Because what if someone uses systems intended for dealing with deceased or absentee members to expel people they just don't like? And again, you can only use code to enforce interactions that the programmers make enforceable via the code. Constitution DAO, a hastily set up scheme to bid on one of the few remaining original copies of the US Constitution, already ran aground most of these problems as the project failed to win the auction and is now trying to issue refunds, a thing that the slack 
slapdash machine was never intended to do. The reality is that most organizations with any meaningful social complexity, even tiny organizations like video game guilds, are too complex to properly express in code. There's too many contingencies and contingencies for those contingencies and contingencies for those contingencies to account for. So rather than trying to turn social interactions into code, the DAO is marginalized into only handling code appropriate tasks like bookkeeping, digital signature verification, and on-chain asset management. But that's not a revolutionary new way to organize people. That's just a productivity tool. The DAO can have a process for voting on actions, but the moment the outcome of those actions move off chain, i.e. into the real world, the DAO program is powerless. The program can't make humans execute the decisions of the group. That's still an analog problem. The whole thing very quickly runs into an incentive wall, where it's just faster and easier to solve problems verbally via abstract trust relationships and promises to the same end results. This is why it's so common for DAOs to not actually have any of the inner machine that would actually make them into what they claim to be. It's easier to just not. Taken as a whole, DAOs aren't some revolutionary new model, they're a tool built onto the side of cryptocurrency that only has meaningful advantages when interacting with cryptocurrency as a tool for speculative trading and managing financial instruments. The rest is just a gimmick, a slow, inflexible tool for executing straw polls. Again, a lot of these boil down to a scheme to minimize liability on the part of the creators. The creators of Inuyasha token, a meme coin DAO based on nothing except the ephemeral concept of the Inuyasha anime, demonstrated this admirably when they were pressed on the issue of copyright, openly trading on a known brand specifically for clout. Their answer to the question boils down to one, a failure to understand copyright, and two, an insistence that it doesn't matter because no one's responsible. The DAO did it. No, humans are liable. Just this amorphous, sentient carbon cloud. And you have a really good way you explain it about the uh, about the copyright issue that everyone's afraid of because they don't want to invest in a token that's going to be told to like cease and desist or. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, to clear that up, I think first you have to distinguish between a mark and copy, right? Uh, so right now on the website, there's, it's all custom art done by Steven, yep. your friend Steven. So there is no copy. I mean, the only person that can really copyright us right now is Steven, uh, you know? <laughs> so, well, what about logo likeness or character likeness? Yeah. So trademark. Um, it's possible that the Inuyasha mark it, it could, could become uh, scrutinized. However, uh, we're a decentralized autonomous organization officially, and the token is launched on the Ethereum blockchain. So there's there's really no going back. I'm just a community member. Um, I'm not an owner. Like there's there's really no single entity that has ownership over this. So I mean it. it it's on the blockchain now, it, you, there's no going back. And that bit also just so brilliantly demonstrates the underlying mentality of a lot of these guys. They wanted to use the Inuyasha brand for clout, but they didn't want to ask for permission because they would probably get rejected. So they did it anyway. So now that it's on chain, it can't be easily taken down. So I guess you just gotta let them do it? It's on the blockchain now. It, you, there's no going back. Things get funny in that frustrating way when you do come across a DAO that's trying to be legitimate and they tip their hand by revealing that underneath they're legally a co-op or an LLC or some other extant legal entity. Unless your goal is a grift, there's nothing truly revolutionary about their structure or functionality. Lee Jin, the co-founder of a bunch of predatory venture capital firms that focus on polishing the image of the gig economy to distract from the ways in which it's eroding labor, has an extended Twitter thread where she tries to pitch DAOs as the future of unions, though her rationale is not only shaky, relying heavily on magical thinking, it's also peppered with inexplicable lies. For example, she champions Yield Guild, a DAO that she describes as a gaming guild comprised of thousands of play-to-earn gamers, an on-ramp that brings more players into play-to-earn gaming, it can represent gamers and lobby game devs for better policies. Its scale also enables the collective to offer benefits and protections, e.g. healthcare, paid time off, that would be infeasible if gamers were operating on their own. This is a tremendous overstatement of what Yield actually is. It's not a union, nor does it function as a union, nor does it have aspirations of functioning as a union. 
it's not even a dao, though it does have aspirations of transitioning into being one. it's at best a mildly decentralized cartel that's experimenting with shaking down players with the promise of helping them by gamifying the process of participating in the guild. in practice, it's a discord server that helps play-to-earn players find sponsorships, pivot from one game to another, and generally bitch about how much their jobs suck. in fact, in response to legion's tweets, the server residents had this to say i've read that through the ygg, dao members are able to get access to healthcare. is this true? is there any more info on this? anywhere to learn more about what is offered? or is this still in the works? as a freelancer, i'm always interested to learn about more options. i actually don't know about that. that would be awesome to get partnered with healthcare. where did you get that info though? we haven't heard of any kind about it. hmm. yeah, i think lee used it as an example of potential benefits and didn't mean it literally, but nothing of that sort has been discussed yet. Now, on a functional level, most DAOs use an administrative system based off the use and spending of internal script, the governance tokens. There's a decent amount of variability in how they're used, but basically they function either as proportional voting power, exactly the same as voting shares in a publicly traded company, fiat voting power, where there's no point in possessing more than one, or direct voting power, where tokens are spent to cast votes and more tokens can be spent to cast more votes. Typically, this script can be bought and sold, even on a secondary market, and indeed, possession of it is typically a definitional part of membership. Rather than structuring like a union, Yield's overt goal for their DAO is to function as a hedge fund, using the exchange value of their token as a means to raise funds to invest into later earned games, and allowing Yield members to spend their tokens to rent these DAO-owned resources. In fact, Yield is so far removed from the purpose and functionality of a union, that the roadmap includes potentially implementing what's called holographic consensus, which is a futures market where participants gamble on what proposals will or won't be passed using their governance tokens as it stakes. It's amazing if you wanted to build a machine whose sole purpose is to concentrate political power slowly over time. Additionally, many use a proof-of-stake staking system to reward members with additional tokens with no gate on how many tokens any single member can hold. This whole arrangement creates a system where participants with only a few tokens are incentivized to not vote against the interests of highly staked members. Plus, anything you spend limits what you can stake, and thus reduces all future income of tokens, which means even less voting power in the future. Members who possess a disproportionate share of tokens can afford to outspend on the outcome of any vote and still retain a proportional future voting power. At best, you end up with high-powered voting blocks and at worst, a functional monopoly. The internal discourse of Yield is, like all crypto, focused on the price of the DAO script and not its actual functionality within the organization. Rather than creating a more equitable, democratic organization that looks out for the needs of all its members, Yield is a scheme that explicitly rewards its highest stakeholders with more power and access. Now, conceptually, you could make a DAO that behaves towards actually useful worker-focused goals, but you could also do that without a DAO, because it's just an organization. The DAO itself is just a mechanism of an organization, and more often than not, its involvement is little more than tech fetishism. So most actual DAOs don't resemble anything like a flat hierarchy. In fact, the ability to buy and sell voting power and the hierarchy that results is seen as a strict advantage in that it allows emotionally uninvested members to make money and gives them a thing that they can reward people with that will align incentives. And despite the fact that Lee Jin is directly involved with Yield as the philosopher in residence, Yield is neither structured like a labor union, nor does it have ambitions to be one. The point is that thought leaders like Lee Jin, who get a lot of social traction by promising that their techno-fetishistic community are solving big societal problems, are liars. They love the pageantry of democracy because it allows them to pretend to be democratic, because they can paint their detractors as being undemocratic. It's all hollow hand-waving and techno-babble to distract from the fact that it's just shareholding. It's the corporatization of everything, the conversion of the entire world into claves governed by power granted by a token possession and enforced by machines that allow humans to wash their hands of the outcomes. At the end of the day, every DAO pretending to be useful is still a forced entry point to some hype-driven meme coin whose existence only benefits its creators and the exchange that sells it. In 2008, the economy functionally collapsed. The basic chain reaction was this. Bankers took mortgages and turned them into something they could gamble on. 
this created a bubble and then the bubble popped. when you drill down into it you realize that the core of the crypto ecosystem, the core of web three, the core of the nft marketplace is a turf war between the wealthy and ultra wealthy techno fetishists who look at people like bill gates and jeff bezos, billionaires minted by a tech industry doors that have now been shut by market calcification and are looking for a do-over looking to synthesize a new market where they can be the one to ascend from a merely wealthy programmer to a hyper wealthy industrialist it's a cat fight between the five percent and the one percent ultimately the driving forces underlying this entire movement are economic disparity the wealthy and tenuously wealthy are looking for a space that they can dominate where they can be trendsetters and tastemakers and can seemingly invent value through sheer force of will this is, in my opinion, the blind spot of many casual critics. The fact that tokens representing ape PFPs are useless, yet somehow still expensive, isn't an overlooked glitch in the system. It's half the point. It's a digital extension of inconvenient fashion. It's a flex and a form of myth-making. And that's how it draws in the bottom. People who feel their opportunities shrinking, who see the system closing around them, who have become isolated by social media and a global pandemic, who feel the future getting smaller. People pressured by the casualization of work as jobs are dissolved into the gig economy and want to believe that escape is just that easy. All you gotta do is bet on the right Discord and you might be airdropped the next new hotness. It could be you plucked out of the crowd on Rarible and bestowed a six-figure price by an elusive Emirati music producer. Get a bake in your wallet, hodl like a good diamond hands, and enjoy that yield. All you need is $5,000 in seed money and you can buy a Farmer's World milk cow. And if you milk that cow every four hours, day and night for two weeks, why there's all your money back right there. And now it's pure profit, minus naturally the overhead of all the wax you needed to stake, the barn you needed to buy and build, the barley you needed to purchase and grow, the food you needed to buy to rebuild, the energy you needed to milk the cow, build the barn and grow the barley, plus you actually need to cash out, which isn't getting paid, it's quitting. This is your chance to stick it to Wall Street and the venture capitalists as long as as you pay no attention to the VCs behind the curtain, the line can only go up. It's a movement driven in no small part by rage, by people who looked at 2008, who looked at the system as it exists, but concluded that the problems with capitalism were that it didn't provide enough opportunities to be the boot. And that's the pitch. Buy in now, buy in early, and you could be the high-tech future boot. Our systems are breaking or broken, straining under neglect and sabotage, and our leaders seem at best complacent, willing to coast out the collapse. We need something better, but a system that turns everyone into petty digital landlords, that distills all interaction into transaction, that determines the value of something by how sellable it is and whether or not it can be gambled on as a fractional token sold by a micro auction, that's not it. A different system does not inherently mean a better system. We replace bad systems with worse ones all the time. We replaced a bad system of work and bosses with a terrible system of apps, gigs, and on-demand labor. So it's not just that I oppose NFTs because the foremost of them are aesthetically vacuous representations of the dead inner lives of the tech and finance bros behind them, it's that they represent the vanguard of a worse system. The whole thing, from open sea fantasies for starving artists to the buy-in for pay-to-earn games, it's the same hollow, exploitative pitch as MLMs. It's Amway, but everywhere you look, people are wearing ugly-ass ape cartoons. <laughs>
So one of the main things that people praise Vatican II for creating sanctioned room within the church for liberation theology and thus the likes of Oscar Romero, that's the stuff he really takes issue with. This brings me to one of Roberts and Genesis' other friends and fellow the principal participant, Martin Selbry. I'm gonna warn you, this guy is a huge piece of garbage with some truly repugnant beliefs. This does get a bit heavy. This is Martin Selbry, a geocentrist and theologian. He has advocated for a geocentric model for years, both within fundamentalist Christian circles as a companion to creationism and externally in debates with the actual scientific community. Martin is the vice president of the Chalcedon Foundation, a Christian reconstructionist think tank dedicated to lobbying for laws that conform to their interpretation of biblical laws. This manifests practically in two forms. The first of these is a specific form of libertarianism that philosophically is opposed to large nation states, but in the short term manifests in the push for extremely permissive homeschooling standards, which I mean, Martin here is in a documentary arguing that the Earth is the center of the universe, so you can probably imagine what the curriculum looks like. Also, they stand in opposition to, like, anti-discrimination laws that prevent employers from firing people for being trans. The second expression is an explicit push for returning things to the natural order, enshrining Christian supremacy and eliminating the separation of church and state. Now, a number of people have posited that this extreme position means the Chalcedon Foundation supports policies like the death penalty as a punishment for homosexuality, and indeed, the Southern Poverty Law Center lists the Chalcedon Foundation as a hate group for exactly that reason. In response to these accusations, the Chalcedon Foundation plays a little rhetorical game where they deflect by repeatedly saying they support biblical law. It's a way of pretending to deny something without denying it, but it's also a way of confirming something without having to actually say it out loud. Selbreed, in a 2007 article titled Answering Tough Questions About Christian Reconstruction, frames it like this. Decade after decade, as a nation grows more biblically consistent and an ever-increasing percentage of its population regards the law of God as the proper standard of morality, it is likely the resulting social pressures, now so successfully applied by our current culture of political correctness, would gradually revert back in favor of biblical moral expectations, causing most biblically illicit conduct to seek more private venues beyond the reach of eyewitnesses to the act well before any such biblical laws became transcribed into civil law. The idea of some kind of wholesale slaughter of, say, homosexuals is a total fabrication resting on a fragmentary, piecemeal, unsystematized approach to biblical law. Biblical law deals with concrete acts observed by qualified eyewitnesses. Translated, he does support the state-sanctioned murder of homosexuals, but only as long as it's systematized. And he claims it wouldn't matter anyway. You wouldn't actually get that many executions because all of the overt social hostility towards homosexuality would drive all of the gays back into the closet long before you could even make homosexuality illegal, let alone a capital offense. Remember that libertarianism? Yeah, they oppose large nation states like the USA because they believe that large nations will inevitably be multicultural purely as a consequence of encompassing large numbers of people across large geographic areas, which provides the opportunity for minority cultures to find common cause, unite, and push for their interests. Thus, smaller, local, Christian hegemons are better equipped to enforce biblical law and keep the underclass suppressed. Fun stuff. These guys are the philosophical core of the principle, and the rest of the film is structured to make it look like all these scientists really secretly agree with them. Can I just say that this setup for Lawrence Krauss's interview with this green edge light, that it's hideous? I get the intent, but it looks, it looks gross, and no one else is lit like that. Anyway, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about the principle is because the film itself isn't entirely incompetent. It's a pretty good example of how the narrative language of documentary can be utilized rhetorically. Because the entire foundation of the film is to make a discredited idea seem not just plausible, but 
important. and to do that, you need to launder a few things. so this is how you scrub the ideas you don't say we're making a movie proving that the earth is the center of the universe you say we're making a movie about changes in our understanding of the copernican principle or we're making a movie about the history and future of cosmology there's just nothing about the jews in the film. it just isn't. it's a film about cosmology it's a film about the copernican principle it's not wrong you haven't lied you've just omitted a conclusion that you know participants will disagree with you don't do a total hack job where you cut up what people are saying to make them say the opposite of what they meant. I noticed she was sitting on her sweet can, like grab her sweet can, oh. You use framing and juxtaposition, the Kuleshov effect, to manufacture consensus. You take two scientists, and in between them, you sandwich a guy with a fake doctorate who wrote a book called Galileo Was Wrong. Technically speaking, you don't take any of the three out of context. You aren't lifting razor-thin sound bites, but all three are energized, excited, and seemingly in agreement with each other. This is a fine line. You haven't made anyone say something they didn't. You've just created the appearance that they support ideas that they don't. It's a form of misrepresentation that's exhausting to litigate and honestly isn't worth it beyond, like, writing an op-ed or putting out some mean tweets. That's why no one who was involved who spoke out against the film took it any farther than just mean tweets. What's interesting to me is that the filmmakers have a narrative that they're trying to work and have continued to work even after the film's release. One of the things the film suggests with a wink and a nudge is the outline of a conspiracy that is actively suppressing this information. All I have to do to shut up geocentrists is to run this experiment up on the moon and see what's going to happen. And all of physics collapses with that experiment. I think there's a reason not to put the experiment on the moon. Albert Einstein himself said that if Michael Morley is wrong, then relativity is wrong. It implies that all these scientists really do agree that the prevailing evidence suggests a geocentric world, but they can't speak plainly about it because they would be ostracized from the scientific community, lose their jobs, lose access to grant money, and generally throw a huge wrench into their own lives. If one day God comes down from above and says, look, these two great theories, relativity and the quantum theory, are wrong, what would I say? First of all, I would say, oh my God, all my published works are wrong. I mean, I'll have to look for another job. This also lets the filmmakers frame themselves as doing the interviewees a favor by leaving it as innuendo, and that in turn builds a sense of intrigue. That this is a view that's so taboo, we dare not even say its name. Yeah. We've clearly touched a nerve. We're clearly questioning something there. Some very far powerful people are uncomfortable having questions. Oh, that's absolutely the case. Also, can we talk for a moment about the absurdity of a bunch of Catholics claiming that their cosmological model is being suppressed by some nebulous group? So after the trailer for the film comes out, a number of the participants issue statements basically saying they had no idea what the scope of the project was, they were presented out of context, they don't remember being interviewed for a pro-geocentric documentary. The filmmakers counter by posting a response video to YouTube, and this is where they continue that little sleight of hand trick from earlier. In the response video, they include extended clips of some interviews, some behind the scenes footage, and a copy of Krauss's image release form. Lawrence Krauss signed a release form. Here it is. Yeah, let's, let's roll the release form. 100 news articles saying that it doesn't exist yet. That last one is a real trick. In presenting the image release forms, they're submitting evidence for one thing and implying it's evidence of another. See, the signed release does prove that Krauss signed a release with Stellar Motion Pictures Incorporated, but it doesn't prove that the interviewers were forthright with the underlying motives of the production. Let's, let's, let's roll the release form. 1,500 news articles saying that it doesn't exist. Yes, it exists. Let's it's show fine. it real quick. Yes, it does tell him that we're going to be seeking out controversial... It's the same release. Everybody got the same. It's the same. Everybody yeah, your same. lawyers made it up. There's and multiple releases. It's very clear. Nothing in this bog standard release says this movie is going to be anti-Copernican, anti-Galilean, pro-geocentric. That informed consent 
is merely implied and again rick is highly susceptible to conspiratorial thinking so he just leaves it assumed as though it's self evidently obvious that there's an organized conspiracy to stop them he had no chance with the principle against the books Funny enough, by posting all this stuff in the Thought Crime follow-up video, they actually give us a really good insight into how you go about tricking a bunch of physicists into being in a geocentric documentary. In an extended clip of Max Tegmark being interviewed by Delano, they show us the kinds of questions that they were asking. Also, keep in mind that this footage is being presented to support the argument that Rick Delano did not disguise the subject or intent of the film. Let me read a quote from another quote from Professor Hatton. Yeah, and, and, just get, and, and then we can move on from this particular aspect because the centrality of Earth is a customer for a second. It's a fascinating. Yeah, it could be a mistake, it could be a glitch, but there are other elements that are pointing in the same direction. Now, Krauser, Professor Krauser. When you look at the CMB map, you see the structure that it observes in fact, in fact, in a weird way, correlated with the plane of the Earth around the Sun. Is this Copernicus coming back to haunt us? That's crazy. We're looking out at the whole universe. There's no way there should be a correlation of structure with our motion of the Earth around the Sun, the plane of the uh, Earth around the Sun, the ecliptic. That would say we are truly the center of the universe. Would you agree with that assessment? <laughs> Okay, so there's a couple things happening here. First of all, that question was 162 words long. It's a lot of rambling, it's a lot of overlapping ideas, and then the core of it is framed not as a question from the filmmakers, but as an opportunity to respond to something Professor Krauss said. Let me read a quote, another quote from Professor Krauss. Yeah. See, there's a big, big difference between asking someone if Earth is the center of the universe and asking them to reply to a colleague. The second is a lot more likely to get a much more diplomatic, measured response where they don't openly disagree, but instead suggest that, you know, maybe they were just talking really fast and didn't word their ideas the best, or maybe the data has some nuance that's difficult to explain, or there's some additional controls that need to be implemented into testing. Would you agree with that assessment? I don't think that this is telling us the Earth is in any way the center of the universe. And that kind of overly cautious response is how you get the kind of replies that you can use to construct consensus. If you just give a listen, I think it'll make it quite clear that we were very upfront. Documentary operates off the assumption of good faith. We go into a documentary willing to believe that the filmmakers are communicating, at the very least, the essence of the truth. A lot of these editing techniques, or even just techniques in general, are really conventional. Like juxtaposing several speakers in sequence, it's a very normal way to communicate consensus, and it's not misleading if the three people agreeing with each other actually agree with each other. It's not bad form to ask participants to respond to statements made by other participants. It's a very normal thing to do as you're building the narrative of the documentary, and is a very normal way to go about getting clear, focused answers when illustrating disagreements on a subject. In that regard, the principle is an excellent cautionary tale, a reminder to always keep in the back of your head that a documentary will never be the entire story. Okay, so I think the outstanding question here is, why geocentrism? Delano has been blogging about the idea for years. Syngenis has written multiple books and tracks trying to push the geocentric model. Martin Selbreed has been arguing for geocentrism since the 90s. Heck, Robert has even gone to flat earth conferences to argue that they're wrong about the shape of the earth, but right about its position in the universe. The topic of this debate is biblical cosmology. What does the Bible have to say about the shape and nature of the earth and its place in the cosmos? They are trying to be the thin end of the wedge, both in the sense of creating the appearance of wide support for their ideas, and in the sense that the subsequent ideas that naturally follow from the conclusions 
presented in the principle to lead directly into their trad cath dominionist theology. Quick aside, mainstream biblical scholars largely agree that the biblical cosmology is neither heliocentric nor geocentric, but is poetic, with cosmological statements being metaphors meant to communicate spiritual ideas. Ancient people had stories and theater and understood the idea of myth and legend. Ancient audiences would have understood phrases like the pillars of the earth as poetic metaphor and would find it weird if you insisted that it needed to be literal. Because Moses wrote Genesis chapter 1. He wrote it around 1400 BC and he was inspired by God to do so. And inspired means that it's inerrant and it tells us the exact truth of what went on. So the task for the scholar is not to undermine the text and wish it away as if it never existed. His task is to see what does this mean and how does it apply to what I know today. The train of thought is that geocentrism proves not just a biblical universe, but one of rigid hierarchy. A phrase that the film repeatedly fixates on is the idea that the Earth isn't in any specially favored or central location. The Copernican principle, named after Nicholas Copernicus, states that the Earth is not in any specially favored or central location. How could we possibly be significant? But I've really completely changed my mind, and now I actually think we're very significant. And so, at the end of the day, the question remains, are we significant or just a cosmic accident? Try to get away from that Copernican principle and the notion that man means nothing. From just a venous molecule to a human being that's in a special location for presumably a special purpose. The Earth is a very special place, no two ways about it. So why do they tell us we are insignificant? They really chafe against this phrase. They really don't like the idea that something might be abstract or relative. They're absolutists, and they want to impose that absolutism on the universe itself. Their entire idea is that Earth needs to be located somewhere special in order to be meaningful. It's the same kind of thinking that says important people are born in important places, and important places are important for metaphysical reasons. Rome is not important because of the people who live there, but the people are important because they come from Rome. To illustrate this, Delano has a very strange hypothetical that he uses to try and express his existential anxiety. Now think about this for a second. If you believe that there is no actual standard by which you can say something is solid and not moving and at rest and a basis for which you make measurements, well, you're going to have another kind of civilization. A hundred years ago, you know, if I would have said to you, J.A., that's your reality, dude, you would have called me psycho war. I mean, what do you mean that's your reality, dude? I am sure, Al, that at some point in your life, you have encountered someone who has said to you, at some point, under some set of circumstances, something along the lines of, dude, that's your reality, right? You've heard that, right? Yeah, but you're not getting to the point of what I'm talking about. This is a man who seems to fully believe that the existence of multiple universes would lead to a total breakdown in society as nothing would be knowable, and thus you would no longer be able to hold anyone to account for anything they did because, like, what is anything, man? Of course, this is all ultimately just cultural. Delanos and Genesis and Selreed are terrified of the other. They believe that they are of a superior type of person and are rightfully owed a dominion over sinners, degenerates, and lesser people. If the Earth is in a fixed position, dominant over the sun and stars, then God put it there and gave it that prominence. And if God put the Earth in place, then God also put the church in place and likewise gave it position and dominance and authority. But, you know, they're wrong. They're a bunch of dumbasses with fake degrees they bought from their hypnotherapist friends. All right, hit me. Earth. Gay. The moon. Lesbian. Lesbian. Straight. Venus. Come on, bi. Bobby. Also bi, but almost exclusively dates men. Ask, they'll say straight. 
but he also sleeps with everything and, and you know, um, you know, I think it's important that we give people space. Can Polycule uh, accept Callisto, who is monogamous with Annie? Great, but a huge ally ever since Titan came out of the plot. Straight trans man, married to the sea. Uranus? So ace that she doesn't understand the question and wishes everyone would just stop asking. It was referred to as Enhanced Fast Pass, which removed the two hour limit on guest tickets, allowing them to obtain as many Fast Passes as available, with the only restriction being that they could not receive multiple passes for the same attraction until the first pass for that attraction had expired. With this, guests could enter Disneyland Park in the morning, obtain a Fast Pass for every Fast Pass attraction in the park, exit Disneyland Park, walk over to California Adventure, obtain a Fast Pass for every Fast Pass attraction at that park, and now holding 16 fast passes have the best day ever, with the only downside being that they now have to experience seven attractions at a mid-2000s California adventure. The over-implementation of fast pass did exactly what Stafford had predicted, and walkways at the parks were more congested than ever. This was especially noticeable at Disneyland, which is a much smaller park in comparison to the Magic Kingdom. The park was designed to have people waiting in line, but now, with most attractions using fast pass, guests found themselves waiting through a sea of people all waiting for their return time to arrive. Also, standby waits for high-capacity attractions, such as Pirates of the Caribbean and Haunted Mansion, were noticeably increased with fast pass. In 2002, Paul Pressler resigned to model for The Gap, where he would also serve as CEO. He was replaced by the chairman of Disneyland Paris, Jay Rusulo. When Rusulo and other management took over, they reevaluated Disneyland's Fast Pass system, determining that the best solution was to begin removing Fast Passes from certain attractions. At Disneyland, Pirates of the Caribbean, Winnie the Pooh, and Star Tours had its Fast Pass kiosk removed, and Haunted Mansion's Fast Pass would only be utilized for Haunted Mansion Holiday. In California Adventure, It's Tough to Be a Bug and Muppet Vision had their Fast Passes removed as well. Eventually, the Haunted Mansion at the Magic Kingdom would have its Fast Pass removed. While Fast Pass worked well on some rides and did increase customer satisfaction significantly, the over-implementation within the first few years of its debut seemed to be clear proof that it was a bad idea to put Fast Pass everywhere. It is now September of 2007. It has been two years since Bob Iger became the CEO of Disney after an embattled Michael Eisner resigned. Fast Pass has just turned eight years old, and Jay Rusulo is still heading the parks division. It has also been recently announced that Disney was patenting a technology that would utilize a centralized computer system to manage Fast Pass tickets throughout Walt Disney World and Disneyland, allowing guests to obtain Fast Passes from their mobile devices, which at the time looked like this. So most of the plans relied on sending text messages to guests. The patent application also stated that the new system could allow, quote, spending per guest at hotels to determine hierarchies of access to FastPass. Disney stated publicly that they had no plans to change FastPass at the moment, merely that they were monitoring how to take advantage of technological developments. However, within the company, executives were formulating plans for a massive project in complete secrecy. In 2007, Jay Rusulo and four other senior Disney Parks officials formed an exploratory committee to determine how the ongoing technological revolution could reinvent the guest experience. Like Walt Disney and Imagineers in the 1960s and like Bruce Laval in the 1990s, discussions once again centered on how to improve crowd control and wait times. The group was exploring multiple concepts when one member had an epiphany. While on a flight, VP of Business Development John Padgett was browsing through the in-flight magazine Sky Mall when he came across a magnetic wristband that promised to improve balance and reduce joint pain. This was, of course, a scam, but it gave Padgett an idea. What if Disney Park guests had their own wristband that contained technology that they could use around the park? It would be like a magic wristband, so naturally, they called it the Experience Band, or X-Band for short. The team opened a testing space for X-Band in the abandoned Body Wars attraction in the Wonders of Life Pavilion at Epcot. After an ideation phase, Disney CEO Bob Iger was given a tour where the team explained their idea for the X-Band. Their proposal was to house an RFID tag inside the band that would allow guests to interact with touch points throughout the park. 
TX Band could act as guest park tickets or their hotel room keys. They could even use it as a credit card. When Iger was shown the technology, he was impressed enough to give the project a proper budget. In 2008, development officially began on Disney Next Gen Experience, an initiative that promised to bring the guest experience into the modern age. This encompassed multiple strategies, ranging from reinventing the way guests order food at the parks to experimenting with different queue types to increase guest enjoyment while in line. Perhaps the most ambitious part of Next Gen was My Magic Plus, a complete overhaul of Walt Disney World's technology infrastructure and the introduction of a new website and mobile application. Ever wish you could get the magic of the parks right at your fingertips? Wait, what is this? Thanks to Disney Parks. This is not my magic plus. I don't know what this is. Introducing Mobile Magic, a magical app that will turn your Verizon mobile phone into... Uh, exclusive to Verizon. It's super easy to use. Just touch characters. Look, make it ah. out just down. Oh gosh, I forgot about this. Okay, so real quick. In 2009, Disney and Verizon partnered on a new mobile app named Mobile Magic that allowed guests to see a map of the park, view show times, and play trivia for $9.99 every 180 days? Jeez. And you had to send a text message to download the app? Ugh. Most impressive, the app allowed users to view wait times and fast pass return times from their phone with real-time information from the park's computer system. They could not book or view their fast passes from the app, but this was still a powerful tool for the time, and it had a valuable feature. Guests could now balk at an attraction's wait time from the other side of the park. Understanding the power the app had over guest decisions, Disney began to inflate posted wait times to point guests in certain directions. For instance, if there were too many people in Tomorrowland, Space Mountain's posted wait time might be adjusted to 90 minutes, despite the actual wait only being 60 in order to dissuade guests from visiting the crowded area of the park. This also served the additional function of improving guest satisfaction, as actual waits were almost always shorter than posted waits, and it gave ride operators a buffer in the event of delays or downtime. It is unclear when the strategy began, but it would become an integral part of My Magic Plus's crowd control features when the new app launched. In November of 2009, two years into the development of Next Gen Experience, it was announced that Jay Rusulo would become the CFO of the Walt Disney Company, switching places with then-CFO Tom Staggs, who would be taking Rusulo's position as the head of the Disney Parks. The switch was Iger's decision, and it was done to see which executive adjusted better to their new role. This was a way to help Iger determine his successor, as he planned to retire from the company in 2015. Staggs was inheriting the Next Gen program and My Magic Plus, and the pressure was immediately on for him to deliver on the team's plans, which had only become more ambitious. Not only did the Next Gen team want to reinvent park tickets and hotel keys, they wanted to completely overhaul FastPass as well. The new system would be titled XPass, and it was a key feature of Next Gen's Guaranteed Experience initiative. The philosophy behind Guaranteed Experiences was to increase customer satisfaction and guest retention at the resort by removing unwanted variability in vacations. The program sought to ensure that guests would be able to eat at their favorite restaurants and ride their favorite ride during their trip. This is where XPass came in. Guests would now be able to book multiple fast passes before they arrived at the park, and rather than using paper tickets, they would use their X bands to enter the expedited queue. In late 2011, news broke on XPass, mainly focusing on a rumor that fast pass would cost money. People took that great, but despite the uproar, the rumor turned out to not be true, at least not entirely. FastPass would still be available to everyone, but priority access would be given to those staying at a Walt Disney World Resort hotel. The plan was for guests to be able to book between two and four fast passes before they arrived. The specific number would be different for each park and would vary based on attendance. On the busiest days at Magic Kingdom, guests would only be allowed to book three fast passes, but on most days, they would be able to book four. However, at Epcot, which had significantly less attractions, guests would only get to book two fast passes on busy days, while most days they would get to book three. The times for the reservations will be determined by guest preferences. Guests would input which attractions they wanted to ride, and an itinerary would be created with fast passes to optimize guest flow throughout the park. When paired with the rest of the next-gen technology, this had the potential to radically redesign crowd control. There was just one problem. Actually, there were a thousand problems, but this was one of them.
X-Pass sought to offer multiple fast passes to the majority of guests before their arrival. The problem was there were not enough fast passes available at the resort's fast pass attractions to do this. In the original fast pass system, popular attractions would run out of fast passes for the day by noon or even before, and that was when people could only obtain one fast pass every two hours. Since fast pass already took up the majority of a ride's capacity, and most rides at Walt Disney World were already operating at maximum capacity, it was not feasible to simply give out more fast passes for these rides. When the industrial engineers ran the models for X-Pass, it was apparent that there was not enough fast pass availability at the parks for the system to work. The engineers quickly realized that in order to offer multiple fast passes to guests before they arrived, they would need to add fast pass to nearly every attraction at the resort. The total number of fast pass attractions at Walt Disney World would increase from 28 to 50. When the industrial engineers put the increased fast pass availability into the model, it still didn't work. Even with an additional 22 attractions, there were still numerous days throughout the year where fast pass availability would be gone before a significant amount of guests could book all of their passes. To solve this, it was suggested that fast pass be added not just to every attraction, but also to things that were not typically considered attractions, such as meet and greets with characters. Apparently, this still wasn't enough, so it was suggested that guests could obtain fast passes to things that don't even have lines, such as fireworks shows or parades. Rather than skipping the line, special viewing areas would be created for these experiences and guests could book a fast pass to gain access to them. Finally, this increased, or more accurately inflated, the amount of fast passes that could be offered, which helped support the idea to offer multiple fast passes to guests before they arrived. With the basic framework figured out, plans move forward on X-Pass as NextGen and My Magic Plus continue to develop. In February of 2011, the Walt Disney Company's board of directors approved My Magic Plus with a budget of around $1 billion. Iger reportedly sternly told Staggs, quote, this better work which became a mantra for the entire team. Staggs was under enormous pressure to deliver on a project that didn't really make the parks or Disney money. Now, when I put this in, does money immediately begin flowing out of my checking account? <laughs> if it's working correctly, yes. Yes. Yeah. In a shocking twist, most of the rhetoric surrounding Next Gen and My Magic Plus internally was not about the potential profit from the system. Those developing the new technology and even much of the executive team believed in the more altruistic benefits of the program. The ability to guarantee experiences for vacationers, to simplify the experience of visiting the resort, to improve traffic flow and crowd control at the parks, to create an IT infrastructure that could be built on over the coming decades, even to make cast members' jobs easier so they could focus more on providing great interactions with guests. These were the key components of the pitch. This is not to say that there were not some ulterior motives. Disney definitely wanted to impress with the program to establish themselves as a major player in the tech space, but this did not create a clear path to generate income. Apart from the new digital photo pass system, which had direct monetary benefits, the revenue that the billion dollar My Magic Plus overhaul would generate was almost entirely theoretical. Maybe guests would think less about their purchases when using their X-Band, which would then lead to more spending. Maybe the novelty of the X-Band would encourage more people to stay at Walt Disney World Resort, which would increase revenue. Maybe the data collected from everyone's X-Bands and account profiles could be leveraged in ways to increase spending. Maybe a few cast member positions could be automated with the system, which would save money. Maybe the traffic flow improvements would be so great that more guests could fit into the park. And the biggest maybe that the entire project was predicated on, maybe My Magic Plus would create such a wonderful experience for our guests that they would be more likely to return and more likely to recommend that others visit. Sure, the end goal was to increase revenue, but Disney's focus was on improving the guest experience and hoping that the money would come as a result. This optimistic and almost quaint approach seemed to be at odds with the $1 billion price tag, but Iger, Staggs, Rusulo, and other executives believed in the program enough to keep it going. Others throughout Disney had a much different opinion, which quickly led to infighting. Disney hired multiple tech contractors to manufacture and deliver much of the My Magic Plus technology. And it was an open secret in the tech industry that they hired subpar firms that saw the project as a cash cow, overcharging and underdelivering. These firms also did not get along with the park's IT team, especially when major issues were found with implementation. Walt Disney Imagineering was not all in on the My Magic Plus technology either. The parks hoped that the Imagineers would take advantage of the X-Band technology to deliver unique experiences in attractions, but Imagineering viewed the X-Bands as a gimmick, and a risky one at that. 
plus, placing x-band readers throughout the park's land so the guests could redeem fast passes clashed with the theme. imagineer joe rohde said, quote, if i'm supposed to be living with fairies, fairies don't have iphones or magic bands. the imagineers ended up fairly integrating the x-bands into new attractions, with epcot's test track being one of the only real benefactors. what's fast pass plus, you ask? come on, i'll show ya! it makes your stay a treat! That is technically my second favorite Fast Pass parody song, but it's really not even a competition. In January of 2013, Disney officially announced the creation of My Magic Plus, along with the introduction of the new high-tech wristbands, now renamed to Magic Bands. X-Pass was also announced, renamed to Fast Pass Plus. The system had been altered slightly, and it would allow guests to book three Fast Passes in advance. This static number applied to all four parks, rather than X-Pass's proposed dynamic system. As rumored, guests staying at Walt Disney World Resort hotels would get early access to Fast Passes. Hotel guests would be able to book their Fast Passes 60 days in advance, while everyone else could book theirs 30 days in advance. When guests went to book their Fast Passes, they were given a list of attractions that had Fast Pass available. They then selected three of them. No more, no less. If the guests didn't select three, the system picked two at random. After the selections were made, the computer would intelligently create multiple itineraries that guests could choose from. After this, guests could still edit the selections, either by changing the time of the Fast Pass reservation or by selecting another attraction within the initial attraction's time frame. Fast passes were now redeemed with Magic Bands or guest park tickets, but during the initial rollout, paper Fast Pass kiosks would still be available. My Magic Plus was introduced in phases throughout 2013 and early 2014, and issues with the system were immediate, apparent, and overwhelming. Reportedly, those on the rollout team and IT pleaded to executives to pull the plug, as the tech was making operations much worse, to which executives essentially responded, we know, but we're in too deep. Spotty Wi-Fi, malfunctioning Magic Band readers, website crashes, an at times unusable mobile app, and many more issues plague the system and thus the resort. There are too many issues with My Magic Plus to discuss, but if you're curious, here are a few. The biggest disappointment with the system was that the tech was so broken that it was never able to take the guest experience to the next level. At best, it worked, but it never impressed in the ways that the team had hoped, and many of the more ambitious